and welcome to Netball Nation powered by Netball UK. Now we're deep into the UK wide lockdown and even though we hope you're all doing well and getting used to the weirdness of it all, it's still nice isn't it to have a bit of netball chat to enjoy and soften the blow of not being able to actually play. Now as ever we're powered by Netball UK and without fail they've got all your netball essentials to keep you training, improving those skills and keeping you fit during lockdown. Just head over to netballuk.co.uk. Now today's show is a huge team effort with your questions being the main focus as we thought it was time to really get you lot involved. Now we did a shout out on social media asking you to tell us your burning questions and advice for each area of the netball court, attack, centre and defence and you certainly delivered so thank you so much for those questions. Now there is plenty to get through including a very special guest towards the end of the podcast so let's get cracking. This is Netball Nation. Powered by Netball UK, your one-stop shop for everything netball. Shop now at netballuk.co.uk. Now, as always, I'm joined by the dream team that is Sarah and Max. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Now, before we delve into the questions, because we've got so many to get through, girls, uh, just give us an idea of what your views are from your window today at home. Um, it's pretty grey out there. I mean, there was excitement this morning because it was bin day. So, <laughs> I've got to calm down from that. <laughs> hey, you're right, though. It is. It's well exciting because the bins are busier than ever now, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, chock a block around here. What about you, Max? Well, funnily enough, uh, a friend who lives near asked me if I would put some toys, some stuffed toys in my window for her uh, grandchildren that are going to be walking around playing a bit of a spot the teddy in the window game. So I can see the backside of Simba, Dory, <laughs> and one of the 101 Dalmatians. Oh, Max, do, do you know what? That just makes you sound like that creepy neighbour on the street. The one that goes, <laughs> she's that one that hides the toys in the window. <laughs> That'll be me. Strong to toy choice, is that though, Max? Yeah, it That's is what solid. I was thinking. Very That's solid. That's what I was thinking. Right then, are you both ready for today's podcast? Yes, yeah. let's do this. Right then, let's talk about defenders, namely goal defence and goalkeeper. Now, they're the backbone of any team. They can become icons of the game. Jeeva Mentor, Laura Geitz, Sharni Layton and Casey Kapua, to name a few in recent times. But how can you become a world-class defender as well? We've had the most questions submitted for these positions, so it's clear that you lot are keen to hear what Sarah and Mags have to say about circle defence. Now, some of you may not know it, but Sarah started off her netball life in defence before switching to the centre court. So, Sarah... I, I didn't know you knew it, to be honest. <laughs> well, I do, Sarah. Hey, I've got plenty of time on my hands to do my research. So, can you quickly describe the key roles for both positions? It was a good job we got sent, sent these questions beforehand because <laughs> I would have been a bit stumped had I just, had I just um, had this thrown on me. But I've tried to keep it to like three or four points for each position because I think it's... Like we said last week, it's really important that people are aware of their key roles, but also mm. that you're not just trying to think of 85 things you've got to do at once. So for keeper, I think it's important that they turn over ball and restrict the space of the goal shooter. Um, they're really the voice in the in the defensive end, so they need to be constantly communicating with their goal defence, with their outside defenders as well. They're often the gobby ones and you kind of need that <laughs> from them. Um, <laughs> I don't say anything, I used to be a goal <laughs> See, point, point, movement. <laughs> indeed, um, indeed. And then defending the shot, getting into the shooter's head, trying to trying to win ball off the shot, and then boxing out for rebounds. For me, are the key things for the keepers. Oh, it's very concise, Sarah. You can tell that you've worked on this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank now you. then, um, now that you go on. Sorry, goal defence. I've, I've not done goal defence. Oh, sauce, so, um, sauce. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Again, turning over ball and restricting the space of the goal attack. Um, working within the unit of the four defenders, so goalkeeper, goal defence, wing defence, centre, all need to be working together. It's not an isolated job. Um, responding to the mouthy goalkeeper who's telling you where to go. <laughs> um, and then doing an attacking job as well. Quick transition onto attack, always being an option and a, and a backup for, for your attackers. Sarah, thank you very much. Cheers. I feel like we should just get that clip out and save it. That was very, very good. Um, now, <laughs> over over to you, Mags. You've got a lot, lot to live up to now. Um, mm. What are your top tips on defensive back lines? How should we set up and what's the best way for a defender to improve the fitness? Oh, right. Well, I would always advocate that the goalkeeper has to have at least two options. Three, if you uh, want to include the centre. Um, I would always set up with the goal defence opposite the goalkeeper on the same side, quite short, 
with the ring defence on the other side of the circle, but maybe just hugging the circle edge or somewhere near it. And um, if they can't get it out to one of those two, then you've always got the centre who can come through. So you've got like three options there. And, and how can they get fit, make sure they're in full fitness? Well, I mean, they do exactly the same as anybody else does. I don't think it has anything really to do positional wise where your fitness is concerned. But specific things that they can do is just working on long and short. So short would be really small space that they work within maybe, yeah, I don't know, three by three, four by four, working in old money of feet. And um, just doing lots of changes of direction, maybe dropping onto reaction balls as they're doing it, keeping the head up aware of where the ball is then you could bring a player in with them into that really small space set them some sort of a target that they've got to uh, restrict the goal shooter goal attack from getting the ball maybe over a 30 second 40 second period um, then also work on straight lines because we like the one the goalkeepers uh, in particular like that ball that gets delivered into one of the pockets so learning how to sprint out on straight lines the timing the vision um, not going too soon because if they are one on one in the circle with a shooter set off too soon goalkeeper and we know it's going to happen that ball gets delivered straight into the goal so straight line drives with a change of direction in it as well max i mean sarah set the bar high and you've certainly lived up to it thank you very much <laughs> uh, and thank you very much queenie for that question we shall move on now to a question from Gemma because uh, we've got so many of these to get through to zone or not to zone that is the question and how on earth do you build it up so that it becomes second nature that one's for you max Oh, the dreaded zone. Oh, yeah. Good luck yeah. on this one. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> it's such, such a, a, a difficult one to do. I mean, if you've got a team who can do it really, really well, they just take up all the space on the court and just steal for, uh, ball for fun. And we know what it's about. It's about restricting the options, making the opposition think they've got all the space in the world to run and put the ball. But what invariably happens is most teams struggle with the structure and it just breaks down. And if it breaks down, that's when teams that can then score goals off you really quickly and really, really easily. I think what, what people kind of overlook in, the, in a zone is they think you just sort of stand in a space and, and then you wait and you kind of pick up anyone who comes into that space. It's it's much more active than it looks. You, As the ball swings across court, the zone has to move and you have to slightly adjust your position depending on where the ball is. And then the attack of the ball in, in the air has to be huge. So you can't just wait for balls to come. People have got to go and win it. And I mean, famously, the, the Silver Ferns are probably the best zone defenders there are. Um, but it's 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 really difficult because if one person isn't doing the job like mike said the whole thing breaks down so it's a, it's a true kind of team defense i think what pe most people are used to seeing are the four at the back that do the the box kind of uh, a, a, a zone but for that to be effective you then need your middies in front of all of that that have to be able to respond super quickly to wherever the ball is they've got to be moving on every single pass uh, trying to shut down all the short options, also responding to us gobby defenders at the back that are shouting and screaming at them, move left, move right. Then your back ones are constantly having to reposition to Google go what Sarah says, you know, looking and hunting for any ball that's sent a little bit too high or sent a little bit too long and also have the shooters that they've got to consider because they'll probably be at least, at least one of them will be right at the back of all that, just kind of looking like the free um, and on their own. So, you know, it's constantly moving, constantly readjusting um, every couple of seconds and one player out of position, the whole thing breaks down. So they've got a lot to think about, but how do you make that become second nature, Max? Is it just a case of practice, practice, practice? Do you know what, um, Emma? Sometimes I say, make, they say make it second nature. Sometimes they, I find that they're not the defence isn't good enough to start off with and by that I mean some people try to run you know before they can walk so you need to start building it up by being 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 strong on your 1v1 defence in the first place and um, before you even start looking at a zone you know there's things you can do you can introduce skills into your, your training into your drills um, like for your goalkeepers and goal defences you know communication and switching 
um, for your middies, you know, get them doing drills where they've got to step up to the plate to stop them progressing and work out how to shut down the short passes, cutting through the line of the ball and also communication and uh, switching for them. Um, you need to introduce intercepting drills because ideally that's what you want to do, steal the ball um, and um, yeah, I think it's one-on-one, -on -one, learn how to do that properly and then introduce all the other bits that we've just been saying. I think I'm tired just hearing that, Max. <laughs> and, and, and Emma, and Emma, also understanding the purpose of the zone. Why are you doing it? And if it's not working, don't be like so many teams that you see that persevere with it and persevere with it and having goals scored for fun. If it's not working, you stop it immediately and just go back to good old-fashioned one-to-one. Yeah, change it. Right then, back to Sarah. You've been quiet for a bit there, Sarah. This time it's a question from Claire J. Rich. Uh, she says, what's the best way to defend a tall shooter? I'm five foot six and I've always played goal, goal defence, goalkeeper, but find it so difficult as I keep coming up against taller shooters. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's hard when, when shooters have got a height advantage on you, but I think it's then about being smart rather than trying to out-jump them necessarily. It's, it's trying to confuse the space for the feeder, so constantly moving around them um, as the ball's let go into the air, rolling from the front to the back to prevent that um, that shoot having the back space. And also giving yourself a little bit more space. So, you know, just sitting tight one-on-one -on -one against a tall shooter is, is their bed and butter, really. You know, they, they, want, a, they want a strong hold on you. They want to be able to post up and, and offer the ball. So actually give them a little bit more space, make them, um, make them a bit nervous about where you are. And also then putting that doubt into the feeder's mind that, you know how high they need to put it because sometimes you're just giving them a measuring stick by standing straight up against the shooter so basically you use your mind work it out and play clever if you know that they've got a high yeah you, you, you've got to be you've got to play clever if you're if you're a little bit shorter but we've seen it you know at the highest level where shorter defenders can can still do a really good job on on tall shooters so um it, it can be done and and it's more about getting in the minds of the feeders and and the shooter themselves and, and breaking down that connection and if all else fails stop the ball before whack, it gets there him. oh no <laughs> <laughs> we we all know how you play don't we sarah i knew i knew, I knew exactly what she was going to say when you started talking max <laughs> now then we're going to wrap up this opening segment with a final question for mags from emma beanies uh, emma thank you for your question it says any tips on how to get your nice players to have more aggression and fight for the rebounds i think we need to ask sarah that as well don't we based on what she just said <laughs> what would you say to that mags do you know what i think from my experience 99.9 percent .9 of all netballers are nice off the court it's just sometimes when they come onto court and they sometimes get a little bit of red mist but i think it's about their mindset um more than anything else more than being aggressive and about being mentally and physically ready to do battle so you know as a coach you could raise the level of the physical intensity in training uh, a little bit more movement for them, I don't know, uh, 1v1 drills that requires the individual to come out with the ball and they have to come out with it all the time, maybe say six times consecutively and you don't stop until you come out with the six balls. Um, you could even raise a trash talk in your own mind, you know, about that's my ball, it's on, <laughs> you're in my circle, that's my space, I'm a tiger, not a pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my <laughs> You know, that sort of stuff. Or, um, you know, invasion games, really, where, you know, you may be, you know, one person going up against a couple of other players and, you know, you've got to turn that ball over within a certain amount of time. Um, or you can do it as a two, three. You can build it however you want. Um, and in respect to your rebounds, you know, if height's not an object and you're both the same height, um, if you're the defending keeper or goal defence, you know, you should be nearest to the post anyway. We talk about boxing out once the shot or the ball has been released from the shooter's hands. Box them out by turning your back on them, holding them up, and then it's just a strong drive to that post and get up there and get the ball. Both hands, be strong and positive. Yes, Mags, thank you. Sarah, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I think similarly, we, what we found is what players don't really like is the sort of like body on body physical contact. So trying to get players used to that by forcing them to do it um but in sort of progressive way so we'll use tackle pads quite a lot um like making players sort of body up and contest for things in a one-on-one -on -one scenario and then take the tackle pad away so that you know that level of aggression you just take into a proper game scenario then and 
it is about getting comfortable with that you know it, it's not a normal sort of everyday occurrence that you you're so so much in somebody's physical space and that you you sort of like physically contesting with them so you do have to get used to it to an extent and then it just becomes second nature Thank you very much for that. Right, we've got so many more questions to get through. But first off, don't forget that you can get in touch with us or any of our Netball Nation family if you've got any questions or comments that you'd like to add. You can tweet us at My Netball Nation or drop us an email, hello at MyNetballNation.com and we'll do our best to cover these in the next episode. Right then, it's not quite time for our special guest, but it's your time right now, Sarah. This imaginary <laughs> red carpet is all <laughs> yours. Uh, the centre court, the glue to the team, the area where the ball needs to get through to convert a defensive turnover to a goal the not so glamorous role of wing defense the center who controls the all-important center pass and bridges the play between attack and defense and wing attack the key role to feed in the shooters mags how would you describe each of the three center court positions to someone who doesn't know netball at all imagine we're aliens oh oh okay oh nano nano <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, so very, very simply, the court is broken down into three quarters and every player it's has a, a third specific... Mark. If it's, if oh, it's sorry. three, it's a third. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am from an, I am an alien. No, I don't want to be that person, but it's, you know. But, no, Sarah, it was Pete, so needed. It was so needed. <laughs> Apologies, listeners. Uh, I've only played the game for about 50 million years. Uh, three, three thirds. So let's start with wing attack. A wing attack can go into uh, two thirds of the court, which is the center third and their own attacking third. Uh, they're one of the four players who can receive a centre pass from the centre. They cannot enter their shooting circle because that would make them offside and they cannot score goals. And one of the main aims of the wing attack is to feed the shooters and to link play within the attacking end of the court. Uh, that's predominantly with the centre goal attack Thanks, and nice. goal shooter. And yeah. then centre. The centre can go into all three thirds of the court, but can't enter either goal circle because again, they'd be offside. Uh, they start each centre pass by being stood in the centre circle with at least one of their feet inside that circle. And again, they can pass the ball to any of the four positions that are allowed to go into the centre third for the centre pass. The centre is the person that links the play, um, the passage of play throughout the whole court um, from one end to the other and link up with both the attack and defence. And again, one of their main features is to feed the shooters. And then finally, the wing defence. The wing defence can go into two thirds of the court and that's the centre third and their own defensive third. Um, they're one of the four players that can receive a centre pass from the centre. They can't enter the defensive shooting circle because, again, they would be offside. And, again, they can't score goals. But they do link up with the uh, goalkeeper, goal defence and centre to attempt to stop the play, intercept the ball um, and to try and stop the shooters from scoring. Max, excellent descriptions there. Wouldn't you agree, Sarah? Very good, that. Yeah. Very good. Right then, yeah, we have shaky got stuff, but all, all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll overlook the, uh, the the three quarters. Oh. And <laughs> the rest was great, Mags. Now, Let's Sarah, just... um, it, we've got a question for you. It comes from Daniela. She says, "What's the best way to communicate the centre pass without the opposition working it out?" Um, well, the best way is not to communicate it. <laughs> 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 because unless you're playing internationally and you speak a different language, they're going to hear you. Um, <laughs> I think the, the, what we work off is the wing attack takes the lead at the centre pass. So really they're in charge of what's happening. And it, it's usually the case that they'll have a little chat as they're going back to centre pass with the goal attack and tell them what's happening and, and where to go and what to do. Um, but I think the key to it is to practice um, your different centre pass setups enough to allow players to decide what's happening and that's based on you know what defense are doing so if the defenders are putting a three over what can we do to break that if the defenders are going two on one on your wing attack what are we going to do in that scenario and also you know when everything turns to a custard what's your what's your go-to <laughs> center pass yeah. so like what's the one that you feel really comfortable about and you know you feel the least amount of stress around and i think once you once you have an idea around that and you've practice those enough and you've talked it through 
it, it's really up to the players to decide what's happening. And like I said, that wing attack should should take the lead and your centre should know what's happening, but also be looking a phase ahead. So if I'm standing in the centre circle looking at my wing attack, goal attack, trying to get free, I'm also looking what side is my shooter on? So can I get it? Can I get the first ball out to decide the shooters on so then we can get a great second phase straight into shooter? So th- there's lots of different roles in that. But I think I think the key thing is that players have to take responsibility for for what's going on out there. And that comes from having confidence from n- knowing, you know, in this scenario, this is likely to work. Let's do it. I'm thinking ahead. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Uh, now then, your turn again, Max. Holly Littler has a very important question for you. Are you ready for this? Oh, go for it. Please, could you settle a debate? I was at a university pub quiz and the question was, in netball, how many steps can you take when you have the ball? The correct answer was two. Nobody got it right as everyone said either zero or one. Only if you do not reground your landing foot. What do you think is the correct answer? Oh, God, the great old netball footwork <laughs> rule. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going I feel to, like this uh, is like an April Fool's question or something. Thank <laughs> God it's a second. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going to give my view, and then I have eminent umpiring friends. I'm going to give a big shout out to Elaine DeRees. Elaine, we love you, um, considering everything you're going through. And if I've got this wrong, I'm sure you'll tell me. Mm-hmm. So you've got a couple of options. You can either take the ball and catch and land on one foot or land on both feet simultaneously together so if you catch and land on one foot then that becomes your landing foot that you should not be moving the one that you didn't land on is the one you can pivot on do backflips on i'm joking that you can pivot (laughs) on and take as many steps come on max what's the answer (laughs) within three feet (laughs) okay um two feet land two footed you can move either foot, landing foot. I'm going to say it's two because the landing Ooh. foot is one and then the step forward could be a second that you can do. Ah, would you agree with that, Sarah? See, I, I don't, I've got no idea. I've, we, need, we need Gary Burgess on here, don't we? He can't be busy. Um, <laughs> I would have said one, but then I guess it depends if you, like Mike said, if you count your landing foot as a step or not. Well, do you know I what? Remember. Do you know what, Holly? Uh, this is great. There's your answer. Years of netball yeah. experience. Yeah. And no <laughs> it, it, it sounds like Sarah and Mags wouldn't do any better at your university pub quiz. So I hope that helps in some way. Anyway, right then, we're going to move on to Lucy Pollock's submission now. Sarah, this one is for you. How do you shut down someone in the mid court who's faster than you? I feel attacked by this question being directed towards me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was something I encountered a lot. Um, <laughs> again, like similar to w- when you when you're shorter than a tall shooter, you've got to be smarter than them. So when you've got a really quick mid court, and it, it tend it tends to be wing attacks who are those like short, sharp players that just change direction for fun. Um, I give them slightly more space, and that that kind of sounds counterintuitive, but almost if you get too close to them on on your three foot mark or you like rushing out the blocks to try and beat them for speed. That's when they'll change direction and kill you, or they'll just step past you on the pass and get a one, two. So giving them a little bit more space is sometimes helpful. And then being smart in terms of getting to where they want to go to. So if they're a wing attack, is it really dangerous for them to have a ball out towards the sideline of the centre third? No. But is it dangerous for them to get a ball circle edge? Yes. So force them into spaces where you're happy for them to get the ball and get to the spaces where they want the ball ideally before them and stop them getting there. Thanks, Sarah. Another one for you here from Maddie. Uh, She'd like to know, do you think it's possible to be specialist in all three areas of the midcourt or do you think the best players are focused on just one or two positions? Um, I was thinking about this. I don't don't really know many players who've been able to play all three. I think if you look at the current crop of players, you've probably got Laura Malcolm can do a decent job at all three positions. Um, I think Serena, isn't there? There's Serena. She can do across all three. So Serena can, yeah. Um, although, don't ask her to play wing attack because she's probably punch <laughs> you. Um, I mean, even even Jay Clark can can play wing attack, but again, it's it's just not really very natural for them. And I think that really the only person I can remember playing all three and kind of being happy to play all three is Olivia Murphy. I I can't really think even internationally of people who've gone across. Laura Langman has done it. 
But again, she wasn't a massive fan of wing attack, I don't think. So I don't, I don't think it's it's normal for people to play all three equally well. And I don't think it's necessarily that possible to do. Um, but it's definitely a good a good thing to have, it's particularly like at Super League level at the minute with squad sizes going down to 10. If you're a player that can offer two or three positions, um, you're really handy to a team. But one or two positions as a rule, you'd sit to. Yeah, I mean, I, I was struggling with one, so yeah, one or two, <laughs> one or two in your grand. <laughs> right then, Mags, this one's from you. This is coming from Beth Kyle. Um, she's got the final centre court question for you. What's better on the centre pass, arms over or double up on the wing attack, goal attack? She says she's five foot one. Oh, I could put her in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm presuming that she's kind of saying that she's coming up against centres that are a lot taller than she is. Um, and so would it be better well, maybe for maybe she's the defending centre. Uh, oh, defending centre, yeah. She must be... Uh, if she's not going to be able to cover that centre pass, that first phase ball that's coming out, then I would kind of give her the advice that maybe she does need to maybe drop back a little bit. She doesn't have to do the three-foot um, stage two mark over the centre ball. She could actually put herself four foot in a space where she thinks that the wing attack or the goal attack is going to move into and kind of mess up that space a little bit. So it makes the uh, attacking centre have to really be careful with the placement of that first ball. Um, thinking about dropping back, yeah, it's absolutely fine to drop back onto either the wing attack or the uh, goal attack and do a 2v1. But that then brings in a whole heap of other issues then for your second phase ball and where do you put yourself because um, a lot of people don't do that very well cover the first phase but not the second and and then also very similar to what Sarah's just touched upon um, a tactic could be you know just let them have that first ball especially if they're taking it wide and not going towards goal and then think about what you're going to do to shut it down moving forwards oh thank you very much Mags right then we shall move on now to the shooters Sarah can you just tell us quite briefly and concisely what the goal shooter and goal attack roles are? I mean, key role for the shooter is obviously to shoot the goals and you want a, a good high shooting percentage from them. What is a good high shooting percentage, Sarah? Well, I mean, at, at Super League, we'd look for anything above 85% has been a good shooting day. Um, the more the more kind of tall shooters we're seeing and the closer to the post you can get, the more we're seeing percentages in the 90s and, and 95s and ridiculous percentages so wow. um, yeah I mean it's kind of going up and up but I think anything above 85% is is a pretty decent day and then high availability for ball so it, it it depends who you are you know like we're saying if you're a tall target shooter you want to have strong holds if you're more a shorter um, more mobile rotating circle then you know getting ball side and 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 being available for for ball when when people are ready to give it to you. Um, either way, you, you need to you need to have high availability for ball and rebounds. Like a shooter who can rebounds lethal. Like you, like you remember Peace Pascovia in the Super League. Her rebound percentage was crazy. Um, so actually, then if the, the shots you are missing, it doesn't really matter because you, you get your own rebounds. Thanks, Sarah. Right then. Oh, sorry. Didn't do goal attack. Oh, goal attack. Goal <laughs> attack. Goal attack. <laughs> we got caught up in shooters there. Go on. <laughs> They'll all be stamping the feet and having the Yeah. <laughs> um, no offence, goal attacks. It's just who you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> She's just going to offend you further. <laughs> no offence. I'll just give you some more. Um, again, 85% plus shooting for goal attacks is, is really good. Um for them, the feeding accuracy is also important if they're going to feed into the shooter, um, along with their centre pass availability. So yes, the wing attack takes takes the lead, but it doesn't mean that they're going to get every centre pass. It means sometimes they're going to be like, off you go, goal attack, go and get it. Um, and the connection with the goal shooter. So understanding, you know, if again, if it's a mobile rotating circle, you know, who's initiating that rotation, where you're going when. And likewise, if it's a more of a target shooter, what's the goal attack's role? Are they going to hang out and not, not go in so soon? Are they going to sweep the, the front of the circle? Um, and then it's always nice to have a goal attack that defends. Rare, but nice. <laughs> so it's a nice commodity to have. It is. I mean, it makes such a huge difference when your attackers yeah, win ball. Yeah, it does. Um, and it gives everyone a lift because it's so unusual. 
<laughs> right then thank you very much for that Sarah now then we're going to move on to a question from does my netball look 40 who sent us this on Instagram <laughs> they've said how would you coach someone to be more explosive or dynamic that isn't naturally well I suppose you just have to add explosive dynamic movement <laughs> to the training sessions uh, include them in drills and to some degree it may help them with their uh, explosive uh, strength um It'll definitely, if you can get them to do it, it'll help the sprinting, um, changes of direction, jumping. So you can use things like um, agility ladders, which get the feet moving really, really quickly. Um, circuits that we use with cones, that seems to be a really popular one at the moment. Just set out whatever circuit can keep it really short and tight with cones. Uh, straight line drills. Uh, reaction drills, uh, ball and wall, so get somebody to throw it or do it yourself or a crazy catch so you never know where the ball's going to go. Um, what else? Uh, timed drills um, or make it a race so that they've got to do these skills and drills um, against each other. And um, I think the Aussies and the Kiwis have got some really good uh, videos online showing you just how they do their quick explosive dynamic movements that just can't, you can't believe how quick their hands and feet move sometimes thank you very much for that mags now then i think we've made you wait long enough for this week's guest she coached england to commonwealth gold in 2018 and manchester thunder to the super league title in 2012 and 2014 drum roll please girls Please welcome. <laughs> it's only Tracy Neville. Hiya, Tracy. <laughs> Hello, are you okay? We're all good. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day because um, we know you're a new mum and we know that basically your partner's come home uh, to take the baby off you while you do this. So we'll be as quick as we can for you. But first up, how's it all going? Because little Nev's nearly a month old now, isn't he? I know. I, I just cannot believe he's probably been born in the most um, trying of times obviously yeah. we struggled to get him and then now with all this that's happening I suppose in a way it, it does give us quality family time but it's really sad that um, you know we can't see my grandparents like my mum and um, the other family but at the end of the day our safety is more important and um, that's what we're prioritising at the moment but it is really really tough for mum. Oh I bet it is. Well send her our love and uh, one bonus for you with having a newborn is that you're not going to be bored are you? You're certainly going to be busy all the time Tracy. Well exactly and um, I think uh, my brother-in-law said to me you're the only person that could put everyone on a maternity leave at the same time. <laughs> 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 everyone. When, when I'm back, I'll tell you when I'm finished it, and then we'll talk about netball again. Oh. Yay! Are you missing it? Are you missing netball, Tracy? I tell you what, being isolated because obviously because I had a C-section, I can't drive either. Um, oh. I'd obviously be. I think one thing I've really missed is working. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it's such a big part of your identity as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's more that. I think it's more sort of the interaction with people. I think that's something that you really miss. Um, just doing something different that's not revolving around feeding, sleeping, um, and then mm. trying to get through the night um, with as much sleep as you can. So I think it's just having some like mental stimulation as well that um, you're thinking about other things. And it's an exciting time for netball as well. So you don't want to obviously miss out on that. Exactly. How, how do you see the Super League panning out after this long break? Um, I don't know. Obviously, my... Obviously, I've been quite open in the feeling that I do think we should run the league. I think to go um, once, you know, to miss this season or to not play any more matches would be an absolute travesty, not only for the franchises, but for netball when we're trying to keep it on the rise. There's no sporting, live sporting events at the moment happening. Um, and obviously, planning for a day one is um, obviously going to be difficult, obviously, because people's health and safety are the most important things at this time. But I think with, you know, to get, our players ready for major competition and international season I think slick wise I think we need a season um, a domestic season for whatever shape that looks like and I do think we should play the full season. Well, let's just hope that that happens. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in today. Uh, Mags and Sarah have been put under the spotlight. Are you up for answering a few, Tracy? <laughs> yeah, of course. Depends what they are, though. <laughs> well, I think they, 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 they've been kind. They've been kind. Who's it from, from Bayman or from the not from me. They're not from me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this this one's coming from someone called Ray who says that you are all her inspiration 
inspirations. So there you go, ladies. Oh. You're all raised inspirations. <laughs> uh, Tracy, she'd like to know, what's your personal biggest um, hack or trick to throw the other team off and get to the post? And what do selectors look for at trials? Right, OK. Um, I think if I when I were playing, I think... I was lucky if I got to the post because I almost played with a six foot four shooter. So if I actually got in, with the ball, <laughs> that was a, that was an actual bonus. But I think if I was there coaching now, I think that there's two, that there's a three things for me. If, if the shooters are proper, you can't beat the proper hold. And we call it the three heads, feeding it obviously to the third head behind, obviously the defender, the shooter, and then putting that ball into space. I do like to be honest, a moving circle. So my second trick would be obviously the roll to the post. I love that one. Take the defender forward and roll it to the post. Um, and then obviously you can't be working as a pair to try and screen off a defender and then obviously open up the space for the other shooter. So them are probably my three hacks depending on the style that you're obviously coaching. Um, in respect to the selection, um, I think selection now has changed. I think it used to always be down to one day. Um, it's really important now for me to to track players over a particular season to look like how they're performing over numerous games, not just you know over one game. The other thing is at trials, what we tended to centre around, particularly in the Roses programme, was about combinations, about how you work with another shooter or how you work with another centre court or another defender and what how you complement their game. And I think with it being a team sport, I think individuals now that that's really difficult to look at because someone who has as who's individually talented may not fit in your team so for me it's like a jigsaw piece and working at who works well with different combinations and complements other talented players around them yeah so it's all got to work together thank you for that tracy there you go ray your question answered now the next one is from faith who asks if you're having a bad game as a shooter uh say look Jewish percentage, missed a few sitters in a row. How do you not let it get you down? She says commentators often draw lots of worried attention to shooting stats. Uh, so what do good coaches and teammates say to shooters when they've had or are currently having a shocker? Um, I've, I've had really bad memories of this, probably for when I've had disastrous shooting games. Um, and it become like the elephant in the room where people all thought it but didn't actually mention it. Um, so I think one of the openness of it is is about trying to find um, a way of working with your shooters that you can actually be really open and honest. Now, stating the obvious that you keep missing shots or get your shots and is probably not the way forward. But, um, you know, there's responsibility for two shooters in that circle. And it's about the other shooting shooter taking on that responsibility at different times of game because you're never going to go through a full 60 minutes where everything's going to go in your favour. So there's times about, you know, taking roles and responsibilities. The second thing is is to concentrate on other things apart from shooting. Um, you know, the the reason the shooter could be missing is because she may be shooting a, a lot of shots further out than she normally does. Um, it may be something the defender's doing to her. So it's about obviously coaching that shooter in them particular scenario. So usually a shooter doesn't miss because she's having a bad day. Um, even though we all you know we can do that, it's usually due down to something that the defender or maybe the feed is not supporting is actually doing so that that's the sort of support structure you would put around your shooter first before you then start stating the obvious of where well, you need to start getting your shots in now thank you tracy and ruth says i want to know what are the best drills to do in training to create pressure situations for shooters um that's quite a tricky one because it depends who you've got around you and what support you've got when you're training I think individually on your own, the, the easiest hack to go to for pressure is um, trying to get as many shots in a row as you can. Um, so you might do 10 in a row. And if you if you miss the shot, then you start again and see how long that takes you. Um, the other thing that I remember a famous one from Mark Caldo, shooting coach, she used to penalise shooters who didn't get two in a row. So during your shooting session, if you missed if you miss your first shot, you couldn't miss your second. And if you did, you you know, you're required to do so many skips or so many press ups. That was I sort of stayed away from that just because of loading within the roses, because usually the shooting session was an unloaded session. Um the other thing that the best the best scenarios that you could put pressure on is working on with a against a defender. So that can be done in a one on one situation where they have to try and get so many attempts, but also work efforts under fatigue. I think them are the best scenarios to put um, shooters in or working with other centre court if you've got, you know, the pleasure of having more people in your session where 
not only is centre court under pressure to feed your shooter, but your shooter is obviously under pressure to get free and obviously shoot, shoot the shot. And again, you're looking at so many in a row um, before you can actually finish your task. And I think that for me is probably where you try and move your scenarios to. Thank you very much, Tracy. That was very insightful. Now, we know you've got to get back to Little Nev. So, we've got one last question, and this is for all three of you. Are you ready for this, Sarah and Mags? Absolutely. <laughs> I think. Right. So, so this is this is coming from Ruth. Uh, she says, who are you all tipping to be the next Australia Diamonds head coach after Lisa Alexander announced she's leaving the role? Oh. Come on, Tracy. You've probably got some inside info. <laughs> Sad, I wish I did. I, did, I don't have any info on this one. <laughs> I've, I've got mum brain at the moment. I, th I think the only thing I've updated on is Twitter. So if nobody puts it on Twitter, it don't get to me. <laughs> is, there, um, is there anyone, though, that you can see getting it? Saz, you've probably been coached out there probably a lot more. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of coaches who could get that job. Um, you'd look at Julie Fitzgerald at Giants and if she wanted to do it, that, that might be an option. I think a lot of people are talking about Simone McInnes doing it, um, who's at Vixens at the minute. Um, and I think she'd be quite a popular choice, but it's hard because I think they've got, <clears throat> they've obviously got 10, well, eight super netball teams, um, all coached by Australians. So you've got kind of eight candidates there and, and then no one really knows who's going to get it, I don't think. Max, what would you say? It's very much like um, like Tracy said about there's just lots of chatter um, on social media. I think another name that was thrown in there was um, the general manager at Magpies. Is it Jane Woodlands Thomas? Uh, Thompson, Thompson um, because yeah. she, she'd she done some work. She was a specialist coach for Nolene over in New Zealand, um, and she's not coaching uh, an SSN um, team at the moment. So that brings us back to can they do... Uh, a big job like an SSN team and coach a national team. And then uh, Vicky Wilson, that's another name that's been thrown in there. You know, she has been assistant coach at the Silver Ferns and she's also been the head coach for Fiji. So it'd be interesting to see what happens. What do you make of that, Tracy? Um, I th I, I'm going down the lines of obviously Sars and Mags on this because I think Australia have always employed an Australian coach. So to look further afield than Australia, um would be ignorant the other thing is i think the next australian coach that comes in is it's trying times for australia now you know it's probably one of the most difficult times obviously with unlimited players in that ssn team um, a lot of the key positions are being taken by obviously foreigners um so the person that has to come in has to make a difference and cannot do what the previous coaches have done and that's just take them as just a national team and i think that'll be a real tough job for anyone Obviously, everyone's going towards Simone McInnes because she's probably the long-serving SSN coach within the league. But there's there's some fine coaches out in Australia, and there's obviously Rosie Lee Jenke up in um, Queensland as well. So, yeah, I think it will be fun times. But I don't think the application's gone out yet. So, um, no, normally netball gossip starts when the application goes out. Yeah, well, we shall wait and see. Thank you very much for that, guys, and thank you, Ruth, for your question, Tracy. We will let you go because we know you've thank got you. little Lev to see to. Thank you so much for joining us on Netball Nation, Tracy. No worries. Thank you for having me. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Ah, what what a great guest to end on that was. Right then. Thank you so much for listening to Netball Nation, powered by Netball UK. Remember, you can send all of your questions in and listen to our podcast over at mynetballnation.com and on all of the social platforms at mynetballnation. Until then, keep netballing it as much as you can at home and we will see you next time. Thanks for that, girls. Welcome. Bye. 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 This is netball nation powered by netball uk from local league to super league they've got everything you need <laughs>